A very good evening aspirants. I have an important news for you. The third batch of prefit is going to start today. This batch contains a total number of 71 tests and these tests will be conducted in both online and offline mode in all Shankar IAS Academy centers. And this batch includes both the morning and the evening batches also. See prelims is coming nearby. So grab this wonderful opportunity and evaluate where you are standing. And with this note, let us look at the articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let's start our discussion right away. Now look at this editorial article here. It talks about the recent poison attack that was carried out among school children in Iran. And the article, it goes on to discuss about the events leading up to the attack. It also talks about the options that are available to the Iranian government to address this issue. And this is about the editorial article given here. In this discussion, we are going to go through the points mentioned in the article in detail. See, last year, Iranian Kurdish woman Masha Amini died while she was in the custody of the infamous Morality Polis of Crime. Here, Morality Police is a branch of Iranian police force that is responsible for enforcing the Islamic codes of conduct in public spaces. See, the Morality Police primarily target women and their main objective is to ensure that women comply with the country's strict dress code which requires them to wear a hijab and dress modestly in the public. Normally, the Morality Police patrol the public areas such as streets, parks and shopping malls. And they are known to use force against those who resist their orders or refuse to comply with the dress code. In one such patrol, the police detained Ms. Amini for wearing her headscarf incorrectly under the country's hijab regulations. And while she was in custody, she died. And this sparked the women rights movement across Iran. See, the mandatory dress code which has been in place since the Islamic Revolution of 1979. And this mandatory code has been a source of contention for many Iranian women. See, Iranian women feel that it is a violation of their rights and freedoms. See, in addition to the dress code, the government also imposed strict limits on women's personal freedoms. It includes their ability to travel, work outside the home and participation in political activities. And all these factors only led to the recent protests in Iran. While this was happening on one side, in November 2022, there was an incident in the city of Om in Iran. The incident involved the poisoning of school girls. And since then, Thousands of girls from at least 25 out of 31 provinces were affected by poison attacks. Initially, there was a speculation about this incident. It was suspected that it could be an act of religious extremists who were opposed to girls attending schools. But recently, the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, stated that poisoning school girls is an unforgivable crime. And this statement by the Supreme Leader confirms that the schools were indeed poisoned. But earlier it was just a speculation, but now it has been confirmed. And this is the timeline of events that had happened in Iran. See, I mentioned about the Iranian revolution of 1979 earlier in the discussion, right? We'll look into it briefly and also the complex relation between the revolution and the women's rights in Iran. See, the Iranian Revolution was a popular uprising that took place in Iran in the year 1979. And this only led to the overthrow of the monarchy and the establishment of Islamic Republic. See, the revolution happened because there was discontent with the authoritarian rule of the Shah. Shah's rule was seen as corrupt and out of touch with the needs of Iranian people. And after months of protests and demonstrations, Shah was forced to flee the country and a new government under the leadership of Ayatollah was established. See, the new government after coming to power implemented a number of changes. This includes the nationalization of key industries, establishment of an Islamic legal system and the restriction of political freedoms. See, the Iranian revolution have a complex and mixed impact on women's rights. 
See, the revolution brought about significant changes in terms of women's legal rights. But it also led to increased restrictions on their personal freedoms and autonomy. Under the new Islamic Republic, women were granted some political freedom like the right to vote. They were also granted the right to divorce and custody of their children in some cases. In addition to this, women were given more access to education and employment opportunities. And this shows that Iran does not have a history of preventing girls from attending schools. Actually, according to World Bank data, female literacy in Iran rose from 26% to 85% from the year 1976 to 2021. Know that for more than a decade, women have consistently outnumbered men in Iran's universities. See, all these things makes the recent incident a dark spot in Iran's history of women freedom. And this attack on schoolgirls has further triggered protests for women's rights in Iran. Now, is there a solution to this crisis? According to the author of this editorial article, yes, there is. According to the author, Firstly, the Iranian government should take steps to bring the people responsible for poisoning schoolgirls to justice. And secondly, according to the author, the Iranian government should embrace more reforms. See, there is a growing divide between present youth of Iran and the old revolutionaries who occupy the political space in Iran. So, the Iranian government should take this wave of protests as an opportunity to bring about the much needed reform in Iranian society. And this will bridge the gap between the youth of Iran and those in the political power. And this will also ensure long term peace in Iranian society. And this is all regarding this editorial article discussion. In this discussion, we saw the recent events that happened in Iran, the reason behind it, and after that, we moved on to see about Islamic Revolution of 1979 implications of the revolution on women rights and freedom and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the solution given by the author now that's all for this discussion now with these points let us move on to the next article discussion now see this editorial it was taken from yesterday's newspaper it talks about the inability of the western bloc to get the support of asian and african countries like india and south africa regarding the western sanctions imposed on russia now, in this backdrop only, the author of the article discusses about new geopolitical concept of active non-alignment. So, in our discussion today, let us understand what is this active non-alignment and why it is necessary for the countries of developing world today. But before that, the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. See, to understand the contents of this editorial, we need to know a little bit of background. See, the Western countries led by US warns all other countries to follow the sanctions regime imposed on Russia. See, US is of opinion that if the sanctions imposed on Russia are followed, it will ultimately lead to the defeat of Russia and this in turn will lead to the preservation of rules-based global order. And this is exactly why Western countries are trying hard to make countries like India to support these sanctions on Russia. See, after the end of Second World War, a bipolar world emerged. In this bipolar world, capitalist bloc was led by US and the communist bloc was led by USSR. And this only later on came to be known as Cold War era. And during this Cold War era, some countries in Asia and Africa they were made the battleground for the proxy wars of US and the USSR. Here some of the examples include Vietnam War, Afghan Soviet War, etc. So according to the author, one such proxy war is only going on in Ukraine. Here the author quotes our external affairs minister's comment about this. Our external affairs minister has said that Europe has to grow out of its mindset that Europe's problems are the world's problems. But the world's problems are not Europe's. See, the author of this editorial is saying all this because the author feels that the time has finally come for the second Cold War. First, it was between US and the USSR, but this time it is going to be between China and the US. But the only difference is, unlike the last time, 
this time the countries of latin america africa and asia they are trying very hard to not take any sides but before in the first cold war era the developing countries they chose sides and they were made a party to the cold war but this time they are trying very hard not to take any sides and that is the only difference see i'm telling you all of these because with this background only you will be able to understand what is active non alignment So the author of this editorial talks about active non-alignment based on Cold War only. Now let us see what is active non-alignment. See active non-alignment as a new strategy originated in the year 2019 in response to US China struggle for supremacy in the Latin American region. Here Latin America refers to countries which are located south of the US. It includes Mexico, Central American countries and South American countries. See the primary idea behind active non-alignment is that countries will not take any sides between China and the US. Instead, they will follow their own national interest in the international sphere. And this is the primary idea behind the active non-alignment. Now let me compare it with the non-alignment so that you will understand it better. See non-alignment refers to a policy of maintaining passive relationship with the powerful blocks of the world. In this model of foreign policy, no major relationship is maintained with both the powers. And this is done to show the country's neutrality in the foreign affairs sphere. But the concept of active non-alignment is slightly different from non-alignment. See in active non-alignment strategic relationships are maintained by a country with both the warring countries that is both the fighting countries here the issues are dealt with a piecemeal approach for example here the author is quoting how the countries of latin america is maintaining relationship with both us and china see the countries of latin america had participated in the china community of latin american and caribbean states ministerial forum in mexico city in december 2021 by the next week itself they were seen participating in democracies summit in washington dc now can you relate it see this was not possible in the first cold war era because at that time developing countries followed non alignment which is nothing but not maintaining any strategic relationship with both the fighting countries during the first cold war era the countries which adopted the non alignment they maintained a passive state in their relationship with respect to two fighting countries but in the era of active non alignment countries are participating in the events and building relationship with both the blocks depending on their own national interest so the concept of active non alignment does not endorse passive neutrality instead it endorses proactive attitude which is aimed at solving problems which the world currently faces and this is about the active non alignment and the difference between non alignment and the active non alignment With this we have also come to the end of this particular article discussion in this discussion we saw about the mindset of the US and after that we saw about first cold war era and we saw the concept of active non alignment and difference between non alignment and active non alignment now with these points let us move on to the next article discussion now for our next discussion we'll take this text and context article it talks about the difference between two types of artificial intelligence yes there are types of artificial intelligence that is agi and ani and it also talks about the relation between artificial intelligence and job loss so in this discussion today we'll see about this in detail first of all know that agi and ani it refers to different levels of artificial intelligence ani stands for artificial narrow intelligence while agi stands for artificial general intelligence see ani refers to ai systems that are designed to perform a specific task or a narrow set of tasks for example it includes image recognition software that can identify objects in photos or it may include chat bots that can assist with the customer service inquiries see these systems are often trained on 
large data sets to improve their accuracy and efficiency at performing their specific task but know that they are not capable of learning new tasks outside of their predefined scope see chat gpt q chat dali 2 and synthesia which are making news nowadays are examples of ani now coming to agi see it refers to ai systems that have the ability to learn and reason much like a human being an agi system would not be limited to a specific task or domain currently no ai system has achieved true agi but research and development in this area is going on see we have many agi examples from fiction hal 9000 from the 1968 classic movie 2001 a space odyssey is an example of agi if you find time do consider watching this movie okay now coming back to our discussion see to illustrate the difference between ani and agi consider the following examples an ani system might be self driving car that can navigate a predefined route an ani system cannot respond to unexpected situations that are outside of its training data an agi system on the other hand it is capable of learning and adapting to new situations and it would be capable of driving a car on any road in the world now this is the difference between ani and the agi now having understood the difference we'll see the relationship between ai and the job loss see as per the article the disruption caused by ai on the job market would be unevenly distributed some sectors would be more impacted than the others see due to ai workers in the low wage and low skill occupations may be more vulnerable to job loss while ai might lead to job loss in some places it will lead to creation of high skilled jobs see there will be more demand for people with expertise in machine learning data science and natural language processing and this is about the relationship between ai and the job loss now with this we have come to the end of this particular article discussion in this discussion we saw about different levels of artificial intelligence we saw about artificial narrow intelligence and artificial general intelligence we saw examples of it and we understood the difference between them and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the relation between ai and the job loss now with this let's move on to the next article discussion Now look at this article here it talks about the crisis in Libya see presently there are two governments competing for control of Libya one is Tripoli based government of national accord shortly known as GNA that claims the executive authority and the other one is the house of representatives shortly known as HOR in Tobruk that exercises legislative powers so Tripoli based government controls the north west of the country It includes the towns of Tripoli and Misrata while Tobruk controls the east and the south. See these two sides are backed by different foreign groups and military groups. Here know that GNA that is the Tripoli based government of national accord is officially recognized by the UN as Libya's legitimate government but it holds little power on the ground. See, in order to understand the power distribution, first you should know about the background. So, in this discussion, we'll try to understand about the Libyan uprising, and then we'll see what is the present state of crisis in Libya. But before that, the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here. Quickly go through it. Now, let's start the discussion. See, Muammar Gaddafi became the de facto leader of Libya on 1st September 1969. after leading a group of young libyan army officers against king idris 1 see the king fled the country and later the revolutionary command council headed by gaddafi abolished the monarchy and established the libyan arab republic he established this republic with the motto freedom socialism and unity and after coming to the power the rcc government initiated various reforms it directed funds towards education health care and housing for all public education in the country became free and primary education became compulsory under gaddafi per capita income in the country rose to more than 11000 us dollars 
but his foreign policies were little controversial. See, during the 1980s, he supported many rebel movements outside his country. Gaddafi defended his actions by telling that there is a need to support anti-colonial movements around the world. So what happened after this? The Libyan civil war started with a small protest in Benghazi against the Gaddafi's government by some rebel groups. The protests escalated into a rebellion and spread across the country. And using this opportunity, the forces opposing Gaddafi established an interim governing body called the National Transitional Council. Later, the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution to freeze the assets of Gaddafi. It further referred the matter to the International Criminal Court for investigation. And again, another UN resolution was passed. And this resolution authorized other member states to establish a no-fly zone over Libya and also it authorized other countries to use all necessary measures to prevent attacks on civilians. So with this resolution only, bombing campaign by the NATO forces started. See, the Gaddafi government then announced a ceasefire. But the fighting and the bombing continued. The rebels somehow captured the capital, Tripoli. However, Gaddafi was not captured. On 16th September 2011, the National Transitional Council was recognized by the UN as the legal representative of Libya. And after this, the war came to an end. Gaddafi was later captured and killed. In the year 2012, the democratically elected General National Congress came to power. However, there are divisions within the party itself. And hence, it failed to bring the country under a unified rule. So what is the situation now? As I said earlier, two groups are competing for power in Libya. One is the House of Representatives and the other one is Government of National Accord. See, in February 2022, the HOR declared that the term of the current Prime Minister, Beya, was over and it appointed former Interior Minister Fati Bashaga in his place. But Mr. Beya refused to give up his position. This forced Mr. Bashaga to function from the town of Sitte. In July and August, Mr. Bashaga mounted a military attack on Tripoli. But he was not successful. In the meantime, most Libyan politicians have amassed extraordinary wealth. Here amassed means they have gathered extraordinary wealth. The Libyan economy which is fed by oil revenues is expected to grow by 18% this year. But sadly, one third of Libyans live below the poverty line. See, a former UN representative described this situation as redistributive kleptocracy. Here kleptocracy is nothing but a government by people who use their power to steal their country's resources. So this is the situation now. And besides this, there are foreign interventions as well. See, Qatar have earlier supported the Islamist government in Tripoli, while the UAE backed the HOR in Tobruk. But now Qatar is trying to connect with the HOR. Similarly, the UAE has abandoned its earlier support for the Tobruk and has reached out to Mr. Beya in Tripoli. Similarly, there are other players including Turkey and Russia also. So we can say that the rule of the external players in the Libyan politics is also very crucial. See, recently, a new initiative was taken to bring the political situation under control. This initiative was taken by the UN Special Representative for Libya. See, he would be setting up a high-level steering panel to bring the crisis to an end. So the aim of this panel is to bring together relevant stakeholders. They will then work to adopt a legal framework for elections, code of conduct and election security. See, the panel would also prepare a time-bound roadmap for elections to be held within this year. However, the HOR in Tobruk has rejected it on the ground that setting up of a dialogue committee is its prerogative and it also said that it will not work with the foreign parties. So, the author of the article concludes by saying that Libya's politicians are affiliated with the diverse foreign groups and they ensure that no initiative to unify their country could materialize. 
Now with this we have come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion we saw about the Libyan revolution of 2011. We saw historic facts related to it. And after that we moved on to see about the situation that is prevailing now. We saw the reasons for it. And finally we ended our discussion by seeing the new initiative that was taken to bring the political situation under control in Libya. Now with these points let us move on to the next article discussion. Now take a look at this article here. It reports about the extension of application of laws concerning money laundering towards the cryptocurrencies. See from now on exchange between fiat currencies and cryptocurrency will be brought under the ambit of money laundering act. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context let's learn about the details given in this article. See cryptocurrencies are private currencies which are not under the supervision of any national government. To put it in simple words they are digital assets which are bought and sold primarily based on the speculation of price rise. See since there is a huge volatility associated with these cryptocurrencies government of India has advised youngsters to not involve in the trade of digital virtual currencies. And as a continuation of this step now the government of India has issued fresh notices extending the jurisdiction of PMLA 2022 covering the cryptocurrency transactions. Now individuals who trade in cryptocurrencies can also be tried in courts under the PMLA. See RBI has previously said that cryptocurrencies should be banned as they are similar to Ponzi scheme. So based on this Indian government is trying to further regulate the market of cryptocurrency in India. At the same time India is aware of the situation that cryptocurrencies are transnational currencies. It is nothing but it involves more than one country. So it is difficult for a single country to curb the usage of cryptocurrency. So because of this reason only discussions relating to cryptocurrency regulations are going to be brought forward by India in this year's G20 presidency. Now finally before concluding our discussion let us see the new regulations released by Indian government. As I already said PMLA from now on will be applied to cryptocurrencies also. See five different transactions are covered under this new rule. They are exchange between virtual digital assets and fiat currencies, exchange between one or more forms of virtual digital assets, transfer of virtual digital assets, safekeeping or administration of virtual digital assets or instruments enabling control over virtual digital assets and finally participation in the financial services related to an issuer's offer and sale of a virtual digital asset. And these are the transactions on which new regulation will apply. With this we have come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion we saw about cryptocurrencies and its regulation in India and finally the new regulations brought by Indian government. Now with these points let us move on to the next article discussion. Now for our next discussion let us take this article. See recently ISRO successfully carried out a controlled re-entry for decommissioned Megatropics 1. ISRO said that the satellite was brought down as a part of its commitment to reduce space debris. See space debris is increasing tremendously because of the rapidly increasing number of spacecraft in the orbit. This is due to the advancement in space technology and entry of private organizations like SpaceX in the space sector. In addition to this the amount of space debris is also on the rise due to collisions and anti-satellite missile test. See these orbital debris are not just India's problem but it is a problem of all nations in the world and it is based on this only this data point article is written. So in our discussion today we will understand about orbital debris why there is an increase in orbital debris in recent times and we'll also see the threats posed by orbital debris. First of all orbital debris are objects that are floating around in space. It includes bits of old satellites or pieces of rockets that have been left behind after being launched into the orbit. Basically orbital debris is just junk that is circulating the earth. See the orbital debris vary greatly in size. On one extreme 
Debris can be as small as tiny flecks of paint or bits of metal that come off the spacecraft. On the other hand, large debris could be an entire satellite that is no longer working. So, this is the variation in the size of orbital debris. Now, why does orbital debris occur in the first place? See, orbital debris occurs for a variety of reasons. One of the main causes is human-made objects that have been launched into space such as satellites or rockets. See, when these objects reach the end of their useful life or when they are no longer needed, they become space debris. This is the major cause. Another cause of orbital debris is the collision between objects in space. See, these collisions can occur between two pieces of debris or between debris and a functioning spacecraft. When these collisions happen, they can create even more debris, making the problem worse over time. Apart from this, natural causes such as micrometeoroids, asteroids or comets can also produce debris by impacting other objects in the space. Also know that orbital debris occurs due to the anti-satellite missile tests carried out by various countries. For example, due to a 2007 ASAT missile test conducted by China, 2700 pieces of space debris were formed. See, this event is the single worst contamination of space in history. Now here, the interesting thing is that most of the debris created in 2007 are still in orbit. Additionally, poor space debris management practices such as incomplete disposal of rocket stages can also contribute to the accumulation of space debris. See, these are all the factors that contributes to the increasing number of orbital debris in space. Now, look at this graph here. If you notice, the number of debris, satellite and rocket bodies in space have significantly increased over time. This is a major issue for countries that have invested heavily in space assets. Now, why are the world nations suddenly worried about orbital debris? And what are the major threats associated with orbital debris? I'll tell you. See, the first threat is collision risk. See, the increasing amount of debris in space rises the risk of collisions with the functioning spacecraft. The countries are fearing that space debris could cause damage or destruction to the functioning spacecraft. See, even small particles can cause significant damage due to the high speed at which these objects travel in space. And that is exactly why countries are fearing about damage and destruction. The second issue is the threat posed by orbital debris on functioning satellites. See, satellites are critical for communication, navigation, earth observation and other applications. Orbital debris poses a significant threat to these satellites, potentially disrupting their operations or rendering them unusable. This is a huge loss to countries, right? And this is the second threat. The next one is the threat posed to space exploration. Orbital debris poses a significant risk to human space exploration, particularly in low Earth orbit. Because the International Space Station and the other spacecraft operate in the low Earth orbit. Any collision with debris could jeopardize the safety of astronauts and the success of space missions. And finally, the last issue is the cost. See, orbital debris is expensive to manage. This is because to track and remove the orbital debris will cost a lot of money. These costs are often passed down to the satellite and space industries which can affect their ability to operate effectively. In addition to this, maneuvering a spacecraft to avoid collision with space debris is also a costly affair. Here maneuvering is nothing but diverting or circumventing a spacecraft around a space debris. So, these are all the threats associated with orbital debris. Now, this is all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw what is orbital debris. We saw the factors that led to the increased number of orbital debris. After that, we saw the threats associated with the orbital debris. Now, with these points, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now look at this article. This is the final article for our discussion. It talks about the integrated medicine. See, it highlights various cases where the integrated medicine has worked. 
So we will see all those stories later in the discussion. But first, we will understand what is integrated medicine and its significance. See, in technical terms, integrated medicine means practicing medicine in a way that selectively incorporates elements of complementary and alternative medicine into the comprehensive treatment plans alongside solidly orthodox methods of diagnosis and treatment. You didn't get what I said, right? Now, let me explain in simple terms. See, integrative medicine is equal to conventional medicine plus a complementary medicine. It focuses on health and healing rather than the disease and treatment. Now, let us say that you are suddenly getting headache. You go to doctor and you are diagnosed with migraine. Now, what a traditional allopathic doctor will do? He will prescribe you a medicine for migraine, right? And you will take the medicine whenever you experience the pain. See, it is like this. When a machine got an issue with the functioning part, we make an effort to repair only that part of the machine. And it functions again properly, right? Are we machines? No, we are humans, no? So, if you are going to a doctor with a headache and you are getting treatment for migraine, does that mean you are healed? What if the doctor cannot identify the root of the problem and just treat you for migraine? It will not heal you, right? But imagine, what if he can identify the root of the problem and heal you at the same time? He can use any means, but he will heal you. That would be amazing, right? So, this is what is integrated medicine. It views patients as whole with mind, spirit as well as body and it includes many dimensions into the diagnosis and treatment. It involves patients and doctors working to maintain health. So, it is not just about treating the problem. It is about maintaining health holistically. See, they do this by paying attention to the lifestyle factors such as diet, exercise, quality of rest and sleep and the nature of relationships. And this is all about the integrated medicine. Now, we'll try and understand what is the significance of it. See, unlike modern medicine, the integrated medicine systems follow a more holistic approach. Its objective is to promote overall well-being instead of focusing on curing the illness alone. Secondly, it is very helpful in the case of non-communicable diseases. This is because non-communicable diseases are very difficult to treat once they have developed into chronic conditions. I'll give you an example. Diabetes cannot be completely cured with modern medicine, right? So, in this case, integrated medicine helps a lot. So, this is about the significance of integrated medicine. Now, coming to the case given in the article. See, recently, two papers were published in the prestigious journals of American College of Cardiology and the American Academy of Neurology. Now, what do they say? They say that using yoga as an additional treatment can help patients suffering from migraine, headaches and from syncope. So, here, yoga is used along with the traditional medicines. It will reduce the symptomatic burden and improve the quality of life of patients. See, I mentioned the term syncope, right? It is nothing but a sudden drop in the heart rate and blood pressure that leads to fainting. Even the studies at CIMR, the Center for Integrative Medicine and Research, have revealed the potential benefits of simple, cost-effective yoga in patients. See, patients suffering from depression, sleep disturbances, diabetes, blood pressure and episodic migraine have reported improvement in frequency, intensity and impact after they practiced yoga. So, this is all about the case that is given in the article. Now, with this, we have come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion, we understood what is integrative medicine. We saw the significance of it. And finally, we ended with the case that is given in the article. Now, with this, let us move on to the next part of the discussion. That is the practice prelims question discussion. Today, we have five prelims questions. I will solve four of them. And as usual, one of them is a quiz question for you. Now, let us take this first question. Which of the following countries does not have a coastline on Caspian Sea. Option A, Iran. Option B, Russia. Option C, Turkmenistan. And Option D, Georgia. Now, look at this map here. Caspian Sea is the world's largest inland body of water, which is bordered by five countries. Russia is in its north, 
கஜகஸ்தான் டு தி நார்த் ஈஸ்ட் டர்க்மெனிஸ்தான் டு தி சவுத் ஈஸ்ட் ஈரான் டு தி சவுத் அசர்பைஜான் டு தி வெஸ்ட் ஸோ ஜார்ஜியா இஸ் நாட் அ கேஸ்பியன் சி கோஸ்டல் ஸ்டேட் ஸோ த கரெக்ட் ஆன்சர் டு திஸ் கொஸ்டின் இஸ் ஆப்ஷன் டி ஜார்ஜியா Now let us take the second question which of the following statements is or are true about artificial general intelligence statement 1 agi has already been achieved and it is being used in various applications this statement is incorrect we saw that agi is not at achieved fully now coming to statement 2 agi refers to an ai system that can perform any task a human can do regardless of the context or domain this is correct This is only the definition of artificial general intelligence. Now coming to statement 3, achieving AGI is expected to require breakthroughs in multiple areas of AI research such as reasoning, planning, natural language processing and common sense understanding. This is also correct. All these advancements are required to develop AGI. Now coming to the fourth statement, AGI is unlikely to have any significant ethical or societal implications this is incorrect see agi is likely to have any significant ethical or societal implications movie villains like t1000 in terminator 2 judgment day can be considered as agi so it will have some ethical or societal implications so the correct answer to this question is option b 2 and 3 only now moving on to the third statement With reference to central bank digital currency consider the following statements statement 1 it is based on blockchain technology this statement is correct we know this right now coming to statement 2 upi can be used to transfer the cbdc from one wallet to another see this statement is incorrect upi cannot be used to transfer cbdc so the correct answer to this question is option a one only now moving on to the fourth question which of the following statements about orbital debris is or are true statement 1 orbital debris is caused by natural phenomena like meteoroids this is incorrect one of the factors is only natural phenomena we saw other factors in the discussion right try to remember those factors if you can't remember it go back to our discussion and watch it again so statement 1 is incorrect statement 2 orbital debris can cause collisions with the functioning spacecraft this is true this is one of the threats of orbital debris statement 3 orbital debris poses no threat to human space exploration this is incorrect again we saw this in the discussion itself we saw this particular point under threats posed by orbital debris now coming to statement 4 orbital debris can be safely left in space without any negative consequences see this statement is also incorrect it cannot be safely left in space because it poses various threats to satellites spacecrafts and human space exploration so the correct answer to this question is option a two only now look at this final question here aspirants this is only the quiz question for you read the question carefully think about it and post your answer in the comment section aspirants i have displayed here the main questions for your practice so if you are interested write your answer and post it in the comment section if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today post that also in the comment section with this we have come to the end if you find the video useful like share and comment and do subscribe to shankar ias academy's youtube channel for further updates thank you